Amen. Amen. How many of you think you're ready to preach right now, huh? <laughs> That'll do it. Thank you, choir. Um, if you have your bulletins, I invite you to take those out and turn to the center and follow along with the outline, outline of the message today. Do you all know what dyslexia is? Uh, I think it's important to understand that or you won't get this joke, okay? But <laughs> dyslexia is where when you look at things, the letters are jumbled up. You know, you see the same letters, but it's like forwards, backwards, all that. Did you all hear about the dyslexic atheist? He decided he didn't believe in dogs. Forwards, backwards, God, dog, all right. Did you hear about the dyslexic Satan worshiper? He sold his soul to Santa. <laughs> I'll laugh at it if nobody else. I thought it was funny. Some of you that didn't get it, get somebody to explain it to you on the way home. It's a hoot. You'll, you'll like it. As another Halloween approaches uh, this week, today I want to point out what the Bible says about Satan and the occult. Now, I think most of us that uh, have fun at this holiday, we, we enjoy dressing up as someone that we're not. We enjoy giving out candy to little children and are not uh, engaging in the occult by doing so. But uh, there is a dark side to this, this holiday that has its roots in, a, a, a pag in paganism. And I think this is maybe an appropriate time of year for us to talk about what does the Bible say about the occult. And we live in a culture today that's infatuated with, by the, the paranormal, uh, the supernatural, and sometimes even the occult. If you don't believe me, just look and think about some of the television programs that are very popular and maybe you've seen as you've scanned through the, the channels. Uh, Ghost Adventures, The Dead Files. Ghost Hunters, Paranormal Witness, A Haunting, Paranormal State, Ghost Asylum, My Haunted House, Supernatural. And that's not all of them. That's just a few to give you a sampling. But they're putting it out there because people are infatuated with it and want to watch that. And then think about all the movies uh, over the years. Paranormal Activity, The Conjuring, Poltergeist, The Exorcist. And I could go on and on and on, especially with the movies. And a lot of them are on TV and stuff this time of, of year. But that begs the question today from a biblical perspective. Is there really another dimension out there? Are there really unseen forces that can affect our life here on this earth in the physical realm that we call planet earth? What does the Bible say about this issue? Well, first of all, I want to start by just talking about the reality of Satan and, and demons and the occult. Strangely enough, while lots of people are apparently infatuated with this idea of the paradox, uh, many people today don't believe in the biblical concept of Satan, demons, or hell. While polls reveal that around 95% of people today profess that they believe in the existence of God, and large numbers claim that they believe in the reality of a, a place called heaven, and many believe in the reality of angels. But according to the Barna Research Group, nearly two-thirds of Americans do not believe in a literal Satan but believe that merely he's just a symbol of evil. Um, friends, the Bible clearly states that Satan and demons are real entities. And if you take the Bible at face value on other things that pertain to faith and salvation, why would we selectively omit this part of what the Bible clearly teaches Old Testament and New Testament? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 speaks of the reality of the spiritual realm. When it says, for our struggle is not merely against flesh and blood, this physical realm that we can see and detect with our senses, that's not really where our ultimate struggle comes from, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, the Bible refers to angels in, in two broad categories, and I want to back up just a minute and kind of lay a foundation that maybe a lot of us in this room might have already heard before or, or know, but I don't want to assume and I want us all to start from the same place this morning. The Bible talks about angels in two categories, holy angels and fallen angels. The scriptures tell us that Satan was once actually an angel of heaven known as Lucifer back 
before creation. Apparently, he was a rather high-ranking angel who at some point desired to receive worship himself rather than to give worship to God. And he convinced the scriptures indicate a third of the angels of heaven, which would be a lot. We don't know exactly how many angels there are other than they're, they're countless, thousands upon thousands. But he convinced a third of them to join him in this rebellion. And the holy angel Michael led the, the loyal angels in resisting Lucifer and the rebellious angels and casting them out of heaven. We find in Revelation chapter 12, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but was not strong enough, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Now these angels who joined Lucifer were hurled down, and they became what we would call as demons and the reality of evil persists today. If you believe in God, angels, and heaven, then you must believe in Satan, demons, and the reality of evil as well. Now I want to talk today about the activities of the, the spiritual realm. What the Bible, what insight the Bible gives us about this unseen realm of the spirit. You know, most of the time all we see here on earth is the physical the things that we can detect with our sight, our, our hearing, our other senses, and so forth, we call that science, the things that we can detect. But I would propose to you today, on the authority of Scripture, that there is also an unseen spiritual realm that is just as real. Even though science can't quantify it or measure it or detect it, it is very real and ultimately responsible for many of the things that transpire here on this earth. There is an unseen spiritual realm where God and his angels are warring against Satan and the fallen angels. And this struggle has been going on for centuries and will continue to go on until Jesus returns. And finally, Satan and demons and all evil will be destroyed for eternity. One of my favorite uh, Old Testament stories is when Elisha was surrounded by enemy soldiers. And uh, even though things didn't look good from a perspective... Elisha, he's just, he just kind of chilled out, you know. And uh, Elisha didn't panic because he was so in tune with God and with the spiritual realm that he, he understood that there were spiritual forces that had his back. And his servant, though, who was with him, couldn't see those things that Elisha saw. And the servant was kind of freaking out. And he woke up that morning and he looked out and there's this huge army surrounding him and he knew they were coming for them. And he's freaking out and he goes to Elisha and we pick up in, in 2 Kings chapter 6. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. I love this. Those who are with us or more than those who are with them. And I'd love to see the look on the servant's face when he thought, he's lost it. Because I see one, two, and a whole bunch out there. This doesn't look good. But then it says, and Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. I believe he's talking about his spiritual eyes. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And then Elisha said, see, we got them right where we want them. <laughs> I love that story. And sometimes I think we don't fully understand or appreciate when we are going through valleys in our lives and we say, God, I feel so alone. And God says, no, I've got you. I've got you. There are battles being fought on your behalf that you have no clue about. Just today, when you prayed this morning, there were forces that went into action. There were forces and means of provision that are in the works that you don't have any idea about. But child, you just rest. Because as we talked about a few weeks ago, God's got this. And there are things happening that we can't always see. I don't think we fully understand or appreciate what happens in the spiritual realm on a regular basis. The times when calamities were avoided because angels were watching over us or watching over a loved one. And there's scriptural support 
for the idea that we perhaps have guardian angels that watch over us and protect us. In Matthew 18.10, it says, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, speaking of the children. He says, For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, does that mean we all have a guardian angel? I, I don't know. But I find that to be an interesting passage. A huge element of prayer is, is when we pray, we are inviting God to intervene from the spiritual realm in the physical realm of our daily life. Now think about that. When we pray, God already knows the situation. You're not giving God information he didn't know before. But we are inviting the spiritual realm to intervene in the physical realm of our daily life. Jesus taught us this element of prayer in the Lord's Prayer when he said in Matthew 6.10, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe he was teaching us this principle that prayer is a gateway of inviting the spiritual into the physical. Prayer is inviting God to get involved. You know, as we think about evil in our world today, the Bible says that we have a real adversary, and he doesn't want the best for you. As a matter of fact, he wants to do anything he can to destroy, to tear down, to bring down the work of the kingdom of God. Right now, uh, he wants to contend with the Holy Spirit to keep you from making a decision to accept Christ. If you're here and you don't know him, he is the voice in your head saying, don't do it. Just think about this. Put it off for another day. He is working in your life to take every low in your life to say, see, where is your God now? He wants to cast doubt and fear and destroy the faith of any that he can. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But as you think about the devil as a roaring lion, I want you to also have this metaphor. Think about him as a lion that's in a cage. You see, since the cross, uh, Jesus has caged the lion for us. Neither demons nor Satan himself can force his way into the life of a spirit-filled Christian. If you have accepted Christ and the Spirit of God is in you, then you have a power at work in you that is greater than any force of evil in this world. 1 John 4, 4 says, For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And can I get an amen for that? The only way that the lion has the ability to hurt you is if you purposely go too close to the cage and allow him to get his claws into you, and we're going to talk about how dabbling in the occult is doing that very thing. But yet, many people today choose to continue to go close to the cage and to flirt with and dabble with this world of the occult and, and give uh, almost an invitation for Satan to mess in your life. Now, Satan can't have dominion in the life of a spirit filled Christian without permission. Satan has to go through God to get. To a Christian, unless we choose to give him direct access. Satan had to ask God for permission to attack Job with, with outside circumstances. And you know the story of Job, that how all these terrible things happened, and, and God allowed Satan to bring these things into Job's life. Satan asked Jesus for permission to sift Peter, or basically try him out. In Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Why did Satan have to ask? Because Peter was baptized and filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and he couldn't be touched unless God gave permission. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The occult world, though, is the avenue through which we give Satan permission to enter into our life. You know, with that said, some people want to know about demonic possession. When you talk about the occult, people often ask about, what about demonic possession? Well, what about it? Uh, as we read in, in Scripture, we know that in the New Testament, in the days of the early church, and uh, Jesus, he, he cast out demons from people. He gave authority to the disciples to drive out demons. And we read recorded passages where that happened, where people were possessed. I find nothing in Scripture that tells me that demons suddenly became inactive or no longer seek to possess people today. Today we put a lot of, of uh, labels on things and, and call. But now I also want to say this. 
Not every person who acts irrationally is demonically possessed. There are lots of mental illnesses, emotional illnesses, and, and things of that order. Uh, many people do things today that are not tied to demonic possession. But there are also situations, and we can look back at history, and with the benefit of hindsight, say there's a, a, a great deal of evidence that people were controlled by evil. When I think of, of people like Roman Emperor Nero, who if you aren't up on Roman history, Emperor Nero, he used his power as emperor of Rome to see that many Christians were killed. Uh, it's said, the, the, the tradition says that he would have Christians brought to his house, uh, they would have fuel poured on them, and he would light them as human torches in his flower garden. He had a sadistic side to him that loved to torture and torment and bring death and destruction. What kind of power drove Hitler and compelled him to kill over 6 million Jews during the, the era of history we call the Holocaust? Osama bin Laden, what so filled his heart with a desire to bring about as much death and destruction as he possibly could through the, what he orchestrated on September the 11th so many years ago? You know, Scripture suggests that the Antichrist who will come on the scene will actually be filled with evil and that Satan himself will embody this one person who will come and carry out his bidding here on the earth. You see, evil is alive and well today. You know, I want to think about the gateway of the occult. I mentioned that the lion is in a cage, and only when we get close to it can he touch us. But friends, the occult is a realm that uh, we would be foolish to get too close to the cage. And I just want to talk about it, not to glorify it in any way today, but to say for us as believers, we, we need to steer clear of these areas. Unbelievers can place themselves in situations where they're vulnerable and wide open to the influence of the occult. Earlier I said that prayer is the means for a spirit-filled Christian to invite the spiritual realm into our daily life. Well, friends, the occult, think of it as the evil parallel to prayer. It's the way that we invite the world of evil into our lives to have effect. Think of, of the occult in that way, whether it's seances or tarot cards or witchcraft or Ouija boards or the world of the paranormal that continues, as I said earlier, to fascinate the world today. Having people come into our house to communicate with the dead or people that have, have lived there in the past and all these sorts of things. Listen, as Christians, the Bible is crystal clear that we are to steer clear of these things because they are a gateway into a world of, of evil and, and demonic forces. And the occult, scriptures say, is detestable in God's eyes and he has commanded us to stay away from the cage and steer clear. Listen to his words in Deuteronomy chapter 18 as he was speaking to the Israelites, and I believe by extension still to us today. He says, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You know, it's becoming in fashion today for people to dabble in this sort of stuff. We call it Wiccan. We call it all sorts of nice names. It sounds like something new, but it's actually something very, very old. And it is not aligned with God or his kingdom. And God says, steer clear of all of this stuff and don't let yourself become infatuated with it. And as we think about people that desperately want to know what's going to happen in the future, or they want to know what their loved ones who've passed on are thinking or want to communicate with them. And so we go to psychics or we go to fortune tellers or spiritists. And the vast majority of these folks, guys, I'm just going to tell you, are just plain fakes <laughs> or con artists. Jeremiah 14, 4 says, these people have been around a long time. Listen to what he's talking about in his day. He says, then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I've not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. There were people in Jeremiah's day who were claiming to have a word from the great beyond or a word from God. And God says, they're imposters. 
And then the scriptures actually tell us there's another passage in Deuteronomy where he says, if someone is truly my messenger, I will give them the ability to prophesy regarding what is to come. And you watch and observe their fruit. Everything that they say will happen will come to pass because I and only the Lord can tell with 100% accuracy what will happen. And every book of the Bible has been authenticated with prophets who not only gave prophecy that came true every time without fail, but also God gave them the ability to perform signs and wonders and miracles as his way of authenticating his true prophets. But he said, but those who claim to have a word from me and are proven to be false prophets, put them to death. God takes very seriously people that pretend to have a message from him. Ezekiel 13, 3, he says, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. They just want to prey upon the naive, those who are so desperate and heartbroken that they want to communicate with someone who's passed on. And so they, they, they fall into this trap of con artists. And many times these con artists will simply speak in generalities and probabilities and they've learned how to be vague enough that if they talk long enough, they'll say something that sounds similar to your situation. And, and the, the desperate and the naive will say, oh yeah, that, that's what that means. And, and then they'll pick up on that and they are well trained in how to pull the information out of you and make it sound like they're giving it to you. People that put stock in this kind of garbage are just the foolish, naive, and desperate people they are looking for to take advantage of. But the Bible also suggests that some have actual powers, uh, but they're not from God, as some will claim. Uh, I've seen folks on talk shows that claim they can communicate with the dead and they get their power from God. Friends, don't you believe it? Acts 16, 16 says this, it talks about an incident. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl, and listen, it says, who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. People would come to this girl, and she had a spirit. She had a real power, but it was not of God. It was of, of evil, and it was of the occult world. And people were making money off her, and she was legit. But it was not pleasing in God's eyes. The Bible reprimands people for looking for signs and omens to guide their lives. And friends, whether we put a lot of stock in our horoscope and we don't do certain things because horoscopes says it's not a good day for that or, or whatever we might look to, don't put your stock in these things, but rather put your trust in the Word of God. There's plenty there for direction if you need it. Isaiah 8, 19 says, When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Scripture says that one of the reasons that King Saul died was because he consulted a medium for guidance rather than consulting God. God says, if you needed to know or have wisdom or guidance, come to me. And I would have told you these things. I would have given you direction. Friends, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, you know that if you want to know about the future, the Bible's a pretty good place to look. And as we watch what the Bible says is to come in the last days and we watch things unfold in our world today, I'm just telling you, I have more and more faith all the time. I don't need to look anywhere else but the Word of God to have a pretty good feel for where this planet is heading. And I tell you, it's heading to Jesus Christ. You know, as we think about cults, and false religions today. The Bible tells us that another thing that Satan does is that he sometimes disguises himself. Or the, uh, some translations say that he masquerades as a prophet or even as an angel of God in order to put a false message out there. You see, he's called the father of lies and deception. And if Satan can't get you to worship him outright, which has been his desire from the beginning then if he can just deceive you and pull you away from worshiping the true God, well, he'll settle for that. And so throughout history, he has masqueraded and pretended to be an angel of light or a messenger of God to put out false messages that we have today and are still circulating today. 2 Corinthians says Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Many cults and false religions today, 
I believe, have originated from people who claim to have received a revelation from God or from an angel. And perhaps some of them did receive a supernatural visitation, but not from God. For their message is counterfeit, it's contrary to what we know to be the, the holy, righteous word of God established by his prophets, as I said earlier, have all been authenticated through prophecy and through miracles. I believe that throughout history, Satan has disguised himself as a messenger of God to deceive people and to establish cults and false religions. You know, Muhammad claimed to have received the teachings of Islam in a vision during which he claims the angel Gabriel spoke to him. And today, Islam stands as one of the greatest threats to world peace. It is a religion that teaches that you advance it by declaring jihad or a holy war, and it leaves a wake of death and destruction and oppression everywhere that it goes. And I ask you today, whose agenda does that sound like today? You know, Bible prophecy describes a vast force of evil that will arrive, arise in the last days and will directly oppose the kingdom of God. And as we watch things unfold in this world, you can see the different world philosophies that are out there and how they turn around and there's so much of it coming back against Christians today. Why out of all the religions out there does there seem to be a spirit of tolerance for everything except one? Because there's only power in one name. Amen? The name of Jesus, the name above all names, that name inspires the hatred of the pits of hell because that one name has the ability to undo everything that Satan and his kingdom and dominion is all about. That name will continue to be the most persecuted name and anyone who takes on that name is going to carry a cross of oppression and persecution, the scriptures say, because there's power in that name and it is despised by the kingdom of darkness. See, Satan's content for you to follow all these others. That doesn't worry him in the least. But when you get serious about following Jesus Christ, Satan trembles and he gets angry and he's going to come against the kingdom of God in whatever ways that he can. And scriptures tell us it will all come to, to a head and in the last days until it erupts into a war and this, this world will be destroyed and evil and will all be destroyed and, and everything will be made new. And so we shall be with the Lord forever, without evil, once and for all, for all eternity. And let me tell you today as we wrap up, anytime we talk, and I know the, this week and last week both have been kind of heavy, so if you've just been visiting with us the last two weeks, I'm not always like this, okay? But we've been talking about what happens after we die. We've been talking about uh, the realm of, of evil and what's to come and these things. And, and I, I wouldn't be telling you the whole story if all I said was, hey, we all die and we go to heaven and it's all good, we must talk about this thing of, of what happens to those outside of Christ. To refuse Christ is to remain aligned with Satan. And the reason I say that is, is that a lot of people in the world today think that, well, as, as long as I don't do anything too bad in life, when I die, I go to heaven. And, and the thing is, that's not what it's about. The scriptures say... The first time we sin, we become blemished and unholy. And only the holy see heaven. And the, the key is not trying harder and doing more good than bad in your life and, and getting graded on the curve. Heaven is not the default destination. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's one solution for that, Jesus Christ. And the good news that I have to tell you today is that today the sin problem that you have and that I have, it can be solved. You can walk in here a sinner and walk out saved because of a decision to accept what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you. To repent of your sins. He invites you to be baptized and washed clean and have a new beginning in your life. And you can step out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But listen, to decide to forego that and just to say, well, I'm basically a good person is to reject the one solution and to choose to remain on the losing team. See, I want you to understand Satan and his demonic forces, they may seem to be winning in this day and age. Evil is on the increase. The Bible said that it would be. But Satan and the demonic forces are on the losing team. Revelation 20 verse 10 
It says the devil who deceived them, talking about when Jesus returns, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that says, the next time Satan reminds you of, of your past, you remind him of his future <laughs> and where he's going to end up. I like that. You know, all who refuse to repent of their sins and accept salvation through Christ, the scriptures say will join Satan in his punishment. Galatians chapter 5 says, Idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and discord and jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. He's not saying if you've ever done these things. He's saying if you continue in this and you refuse to turn from it stubbornly and say, I'm going to live the way I want to. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21 says, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts or are involved in the occult like we've talked about today, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Friends, I bring it up not to be a, a joy kill this morning, but because I don't want that for anybody here. And I don't want anybody leaving, not being told the truth, that, and leaving thinking, well, heaven's my default destination as long as I don't do anything too big. All of us, all of us, me included in that, need the blood of Jesus Christ over our lives. Amen? And maybe there's someone here today thinking of themselves as basically a good person, but you've never invited Jesus and what he did on the cross to set you free from the bondage of sin. Today can be an eternity-changing day for you. Now, I tell you all these things about the occult, not to freak you out if you ever, when you were younger, went over to somebody's house and y'all thought it would be cool to have a seance, okay? Because I bet a lot of us in this room have done that. Or at some point in the past, somebody got out the Ouija board and we all thought it'd be cool to ask it questions and it started moving and it freaked us out. And now you think you're in the occult, right? That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is that now that you, now that you know better, you need to do better. And just say, you know what? I'm not getting close to the cage anymore. I am a blood-bought saint of God, and I am spirit-filled, and I've got no time for that in my life. Steer clear of it. Profess your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and be baptized. And the Scriptures say, if you choose to do that, you can step from the kingdom of darkness into the wonderful, glorious kingdom of light and live a spirit-filled life for your journey here on this earth and be assured that what comes for you is only an upgrade when you reach the end of this journey. Luke chapter 15, verse 10 says, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Today, wouldn't it be awesome if we could beat up on the devil a little bit and take a soul from the kingdom of darkness and through the blood of Jesus pull him over to the kingdom of light and say, my child, you were born for much more than this. I would love to get on his last nerve today and put a beat down on the devil if somebody felt so led to make that decision today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that, Lord, in this world, in this physical realm, even though sometimes it looks like things are out of control, God, nothing catches you off guard. Nothing catches you by surprise and Lord, you have given us your, your word about what is to come just so that we know that, that it's all going according to plan. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ who has made a doorway for us to step from the realm of darkness and sin into your glorious light, into your kingdom. And Father, maybe there's someone here today that needs to take that step. And Lord, there's, there's not a whole lot more they need to know to start this journey. And Lord, you'll teach us so much along the way. I just pray that you'll give courage to that one today that maybe needs to take that step into your wonderful kingdom of life. Thank you for Jesus who not only died to take our punishment, but who was buried and he resurrected. He has already defeated sin and death in the grave and he has gone before us and now is in a glorious hope waiting for us who will come to him. Father, I just pray that your spirit will move now as we offer this invitation. Reach out to the soul that needs Jesus Christ today. Reach out to the downtrodden today, Lord. And maybe they need to step into the prayer room and have someone lift them up and intercede for them, Lord. Maybe there are some today carrying burdens that they need to sense the presence of your Holy Spirit 
in these next few moments and know the tremendous love that you have for them and that this church family has for them. Just do your work now in these next few sacred moments. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our song of invitation.